Well, it's the second week in our series, Holy Spirit. You can see today I've got the t-shirt. Last week we were looking at living under the influence. And it really does feel as if we're experiencing a fresh move of God's Spirit. Because in response to these three-minute online testimonies, do you know people have actually responded to the gospel? People have been saved. I hope you're celebrating at home today as well. And uh, as people have been sharing the live stream or even afterwards sharing it as a watch party, do you know this is spoken to people and, and people have had special times with loved ones and, and even have prayed for loved ones uh, in, their, in these last days of their lives. And just because they've been prompted by the Living Hope live stream, it's such a, such a joy. Such a move of God at the moment. And, and you know what? Total strangers have been saved in recent weeks. And they've already joined uh, life groups. We have those on Wednesday night, the Zoom life groups. I knew the people even joined some of our family gatherings on our private Facebook groups last week. Isn't that amazing? You know, God is on the move. You know, uh, and uh, we are living under the inference. Holy Spirit, would you do even more. And let me just say, if you or any of your friends are, are, are showing interest and you'd like to help them move forward, um, you can send them or, or get a starter pack yourself. Just simply text 493-500 or info at livinghope.im and we'll get one to you as a next step. Now, not for your library, but if you're helping someone, you think, oh, this could be a good next step for them. Why don't you order a starter pack for them? Well, as I already said, last week was Pentecost Sunday when the church celebrated the coming of the Spirit. Pentecost wasn't a Christian thing. Actually, Pentecost was a Jewish festival 50 days after Passover. And in that upper room, the disciples, the apostles were gathered in obedience to Jesus. That's what Jesus had said. And as they waited and as they prayed, according to the promise, as they waited, the fire of God fell on them. It was like a mighty rushing wind came into the room. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came and rested and remained upon them. And he even spoke by the Spirit in other tongues. Miraculous things were happening. And then their hearts were changed. They weren't trying to keep an external law. God put the Spirit in them. Give them a new heart, God. The God's law was written on their hearts. They had a new desire to live holy and obedient lives. Yes, and uh, and they were desperate to share this good news message with all of their friends who had gathered in Jerusalem. But not only that, they had a passion to go to the ends of the world. And, and they were turning the world upside down. Or maybe they were turning it right side up. But you know what? As they went out on that day and 3,000 people are saved and there's a commotion and, and the life of God was on them. Oh my goodness, people started to ridicule them. And here I'll read for you Acts chapter 2 verses 14 to 17. Then Peter stepped forward with the other 11 apostles and shouted to the crowd, Listen carefully, all of you, fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem. Make no mistake about this. These people are not drunk, as some of you are assuming. Nine o'clock in the morning is much too early for that. No, what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. In the last days, they started then and we are still in the last days. And God is still pouring out his spirit right into your homes today. And they weren't drunk. They were overcome or they were influenced by the Spirit. And you know, in the Bible, new wine is this biblical picture of the coming of the Spirit of God with the kingdom of God. We see that in Jesus' miracle or sign in John's Gospel, chapter 2, the first sign that he did, turning water into wine. It's a wedding feast. It's a joy-filled celebration. We see that parallel in Ephesians 5. Don't get drunk in wine. Be filled with the Spirit. Be under the godly influence of the Holy Spirit. You know, when I was in my late teens in Northern Ireland, I went around with a group of Christian guys, many of whom were older than me. But you know what? When we went out, people thought that we had been drinking. And I need to tell you that we were all teetotal, to be honest. And uh, yet these people thought, like, what are they on? But you know what it was? It was the life of God on us. It was noisy joy. And that's what we saw on the day of Pentecost. These people were full of it, <laughs> full of the Holy Ghost, full of the Holy Ghost. And I want to think today about 
how to keep the new wine bubbling in our lives. You know, God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. But then the Holy Spirit comes when we trust Christ and there's the inner presence of God. And then God also manifests his presence. And I'm sure that many of you joining with me today, you've experienced the new wine of God. You know, there have been times when you've really, oh my goodness, what's God? I'm tingling. What, what's what's God do, doing? And I remember a, a, a year before I came to the Isle of Man to lead the church here, uh, we really sensed the move of God in the church when I was the minister's assistant, particularly among the 18 to 30s group. But, but it was a time of life in the church. I remember a weekend away and God was doing amazing things amongst us, love and his presence. And just we were, he was stretching us in the new ways. It was, it was amazing. But the problem was it didn't last. And Jesus talks about the problem of, of new wine and old wineskins. You see, the new wine, it, it fizzes and, and it bubbles and it's alive and, 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 and it's vibrant. And, and in the New Testament, they, they didn't pour the new wine into glass bottles because it needed room to grow. It needed room to live. Uh, no, they, they used semi-cured goat skins, and, and, uh, which were um, needled and uh, threaded together. And, and, and they created these wine skins. And, and so the new wine in them could actually move uh, and grow. And, and, and the wine skin, the new wine skin could expand with the growth of the wine. But then Jesus talks about the problem is you can't put that new wine into an old wine skin because it's already hardened. It's done all the stretching it can. That's it. And uh, it'll burst and, and the wine will be ruined and the wine skin will be ruined. And, and I, you know, I just want to learn how to stay bubbling. I want to learn how to stay alive in the Holy Spirit that, that, that until I go out, until they have me six foot under or Jesus returns, I'm bubbling. You know, that people say, are you drunk? Like, what, are you, what drugs are you on? I'm not on any drugs. I'm not on anything from earth. I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. And we're going to look at this story today. I think Becky's going to read it for us from Luke 5, 33 to 39. Thank you, Becky. One day, some people said to Jesus, John the Baptist's disciples fast and pray regularly, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees. Why are your disciples always eating and drinking? Jesus responded, do wedding guests fast while celebrating with the groom? Of course not. But someday the groom will be taken away from them and then they will fast. Then Jesus gave them this illustration. No one tears a piece of cloth from a new garment and uses it to patch an old garment. For then the new garment would be ruined and the new patch wouldn't even match the old garment. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins for the new wine would burst the wineskins, spilling the wine and ruining the skins. New wine must be stored in new wineskins. But no one who drinks the old wine seems to want the new wine. The old is just fine, they say. So how to keep the new wine bubbling in your life? Now, it's clear that many of the contemporaries of Jesus had lost their fizz a long time ago. And they were always trying to trick and trap him into saying something that's tweetable. You know, if you, if you kind of get it wrong just for a little bit, somebody's going to tweet that on you. And their, their faith, though once sincere, had become dead and, and law and rigid and condemning. And, and they had their own pet benchmarks. You know, why aren't you following our traditions? Why aren't you just like us? They were passionate about their traditions, but they were as miserable as sin. Have you ever seen that? I think it's a Spielberg movie, uh, Amistad, and, uh, and here the group of Christians are helping to liberate these people on this slave ship, and there's the court case, and, and they come out of the court case, and all the Christians are outside, and they're as miserable as sin. You know, there's no life on them. They're doing the right thing, but actually, oh, there's no joy. There's no life on them. Hey. Thank God for happy, happy churches. <laughs> I heard a true story of somebody who was looking for a church. They live in London and they decided, there's a lot of churches in London, but on a Sunday morning for a number of weeks, they keep walking around their community and walk past all the churches. And then they eventually chose a church. And, 
Uh, they told the story to the pastor, but they did every Sunday morning. And the pastor said, well, why did you choose our church? He said, well, it was easy. Yours was the only church that people came out smiling <laughs> at the end of the service. What am I going to say? It's amazing grace. Please tell your face. Yes. Yeah. Thank God for the joy of the Holy Spirit. Well, yeah, we need to keep this new wine bubbling in our lives. Well, three thoughts from this passage today. Number one, be eager, church, for new wine. Don't be a when we. Be eager for the new wine. Don't be a when we. Now, banks people know all about when we. So we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But yeah, I remember a, a, a fellow minister in the Isle of Man, uh, a different denomination, and he shared the story of when he started leading this congregation and the sexton or the caretaker, the person in charge of the practicalities of the church, he'd been there for 40 years. And so the uh, vicar says to the sexton, oh, 40 years, that's a long time to be in the church. I'm sure you've seen a, a lot of change in the last 40 years, to which he replied, yes, and successfully resisted every one. <laughs> You know, we all say we want change, but few of us want to go through the process and the pain of change. And here's what the Bible says. No one who drinks the old wine seems to want the new wine. The old's just fine, they say. It's not always the way. You know, we're comfortable with what we know. Don't be a when we. Jonathan, what's a when we? Okay. When we were in our last church, this is the way we did it. When we were in this group, when we were part of this worship team, you know, when we lived in that place, and people are always looking back, and that's the benchmark of how it should be done. In fact, Solomon says in Ecclesiastes, don't long for the good old days. This is not wise. Paul says we are to go from glory to glory. You know, when the Holy Spirit actually going from glory to glory, or Moses under the old covenant, the glory started to diminish. His face glowed less. But in this new covenant, if the Holy Ghost comes on us and it's glory to glory. The older the I get, I, the more alive I should be in Christ Jesus. And I'm telling you the truth, church. This is not a, a tagline. Your best is still ahead of you. Right? It's not the good old days. They were not your best. If you'll open up to the Holy Spirit today, your best is still ahead of you because you're going from glory the glory. Let me ask you a question. Was there ever a time when you were more full of the wine of God, the Spirit of God, than you are today? If you say yes, do you know what the reality is? You're a backslider. You may think that other people are backsliders, but in God's perspective, you're a backslider. I'm a backslider. If kind of I'm looking back to the year before I came to the Isle of Man, that was the highlight of my life. No, this is that, and it's going to get even better with Jesus. This isn't positive thinking. This is the promises of God's word, glory to glory. And if you are backslidden, if you are living in the good old days, the when we, it's time to change. God wants to get you fizzing again. He wants you to come alive. And here's what the prophet Isaiah said. I will pour water on thirsty land, streams on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. You know, it's when you feel dry. It's in the wilderness. That's where God works. And God always shapes his sons and daughters in the wilderness. He took Moses to the wilderness and shaped him. He, he brought Israel, his son, out of Egypt and shaped them in the wilderness. I, 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 Elijah's in the wilderness. John the Baptist is in the wilderness. Jesus is in the wilderness. Paul is even in the wilderness. This is where God shapes us and where the river starts to flow. It's after a barren time. You, if you think you've had a barren time, this is when the river of God starts to flow. You know, I've started ordering myself t-shirts. Um, this one came in the post. This a little, uh, a little bit late. But uh, if you were to get a t-shirt for lockdown, after lockdown, you know, would your t-shirt say, I survived? lockdown or would your t-shirt say i thrived in lockdown you know if it feels like a desert at the moment this is just the time that god wants to refresh and renew you and this word is about keeping the spirit alive that it doesn't spoil but stays alive and you grow and you expand be ex 
expectant for a new wine. I'm going to pray for you at the close of this message. And pray for yourself every day. Be expectant of new wine. Don't be a when we. And then secondly, follow the truth of God's word, not the traditions of men. You see, at one time, the movements like the Pharisees, who were now opposing Jesus, were actually thriving movements that God honoured. And that's a warning for all movements like Living Hope and 412 and a warning for denominations. You see, they start well and, and for one generation they're woo-hoo-hoo and then they, they can't continue to stretch and move forward into the newness of God when the Spirit moves. You know, do you know who the biggest critics of the new move of God normally are? Those who experience the last move of God. And here in Luke 5, 33, we read, One day, some people said to Jesus, John the Baptist's disciples fast and pray regularly. And so the disciples of the Pharisees. Why are your disciples always eating and drinking? Why are you a happy, clappy church? Why aren't you miserable like us? <laughs> you know, the, the law said you only had to fast once a year. Now, the Pharisees had found that fasting was great. Fasting brought them nearer to God. But then, do you know what they did? They started to impose it upon people as a law. We're going to fast these days, these times, and you're going to fast with us. This is what you must do. And so it became a man-made thing, the traditions of the elders. And we even do that today, judging people's spirituality against the traditions of men, not the truth, not scripture, you know. And so we need to be careful. You know, I love to see it in Living Hope when everybody comes forward and uh, we're all worshiping together and we want to model that. But I can't have this attitude to maybe just because people aren't um, doing what I'm doing that God isn't. But let me just say that the Bible does talk about shouting for joy and raising hands and twirling around and all those sorts of things. But I can never fall into the trap of, me, of kind of introducing traditions that become benchmarks for the church. And so they would, they're complaining about them partying instead of fasting because the bridegroom, Jesus, is with them. And uh, then they complained about him healing on the Sabbath. You're healing. Look at what you're doing on the Sabbath. And uh, look at your disciples are doing the fields on the, on the Sabbath because they had all these little fence laws, you know, that maybe they would walk in a field and they would stand in the green and put it into the, into the soil and they might spit on the soil and, 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 and it kind of starts to germinate. And that's, that's work. And, all sorts of things like that. Jesus said, you're putting burdens on men's backs, but you won't even lift a finger to help them. We need to focus on the truth. They, they become focused on traditions, focus on the word of God. And you know, the word of God is a lot in it. You know, if you've grown up in church like me, you've seen a lot of old bags. Sorry, I'm not talking about any person, but you know, things that we have allowed, traditions to stop the love and the life of God moving. You know, even in Living Hope, I remember asking somebody, could you move seats? This is my seat. You know, that isn't going to make for the life of God and welcoming other people. Or maybe an order of service, we do do it this way. And, you know, when people start changing the order of service, you're going to have the worship after the preach. <laughs> I remember when I was an assistant pastor in a great church and a great, and a great time, but I came nearest to be being fired. I didn't re respond or, or say anything wrong, but it was one Sunday night I was preaching and there were always this big flowers. Why do pastors always have flowers beside them? Have you noticed no flowers beside me? But anyway, I love gardens, but flowers in the gardens, right? Animals in the wild, not in zoos, flowers in the gardens, anyway. But they had this big bunch of flowers beside the lectern. On a Sunday, Sunday morning, you preach from the pulpit, 20 foot above contradiction. Sunday night, smaller crowd came down to the lecture. And I, I, I'm not using my arms too much then. I must have done the old kung fu fighting like Ewan likes the kung fu when he's preaching. And so I decided, can we just move these, during the sermon, can we just move these flowers? Well, I tell you what, afterwards, <laughs> oh my goodness. I had, you know, it's a bit like when you finish preaching, the first person that comes to you is normally the devil. You know, they kind of tell you where you went wrong. Like, that was not pleasant. I got dogs abused that night. You know, lovely church. But suddenly, <gasps> the wineskin was touched. And I'm sure you know. I mean, but let me tell you, new churches like Living Hope, we have our liturgy. We get stuck in man-made systems, our traditions, rather than following the Spirit. And when I, when I say, you know, don't follow the traditions of man, follow the, the words, you know, you know, if you honestly read the Bible, like there's a lot of crazy things that people do in the Bible under the leading of the Spirit, never ungodly, 
But things that you might be uncomfortable with today. I mean, David dancing wildly. And of course, uh, Mikhail is there pointing and criticizing him. You know, that doesn't fit my way. You're dancing and celebrating and all this type of thing. David and eating the, the, show, the ceremonial bread and people criticizing him for that. A prostitute who could have divorced his wife. And why do you keep taking her back? Well, because this is what the Lord says. All sorts of weird prophetic actions. <laughs> Just read the prophet Isaiah or Ezekiel. Like, is, that's wild. Jesus spitting on mud. <laughs> Let me just rub this in your eyes. Let me just stick my fingers in your ears. Why didn't you just go into that river there and dip seven times? We haven't done it that way before. <laughs> we haven't done it that way before. Hmm. You know, in the book of Acts, Luke says that God was doing extraordinary miracles. You know, out of the box things that, oh my goodness, this is wild. Handkerchiefs. The handkerchiefs that had the anointing on them and sent them to people. And people were healed, not by praying and not by fasting and not by oil, by a handkerchief. Hey, we haven't done it that way before. Now, I'm not necessarily saying start a ministry of handkerchiefs. But what I am saying, are we stuck in the tradition? The traditions of man will kill us. Focus on the truth. And we start to look at God's word. We start to say, ah, actually the spirit has written the word here. God, yeah, will always stretch us. There are new things that will never contradict the word, but there are always new things. Yeah, always new things. I was thinking about my friend Sharon's miraculous healing. Many of you will know Sharon. She had a, uh, a diagnosis of terminal cancer. Absolutely no hope. You know, and often you know, we'll pray for people, we'll anoint them with oil, we'll fast. You know, that's, I suppose, a wineskin. But, you know, things are just getting worse for her. And, and if you ask Sharon, she'll say to you, well, there were a couple of key things that really helped her. And one was getting into the Word and finding healing verses. And, and actually, Psalm 91 was a, was a word that God made alive come to made alive and come to her and really help her. In Proverbs 4, 20 to 22, your word is medicine to my bones and life. And Isaiah 53, and by your wounds, you've been healed. And But then there's another time, and I think this is, Sharon would say, this is significant. You know, everybody and everybody and their granny, here's a pastor's wife that's dying and we can't do anything and the scans and all that. And I think they were out for dinner with a, at a couple's home uh, this evening. And at the dinner table, imagine this. Somebody gets a word of knowledge. I think there's a demonic curse in your life. You know, some of you are already thinking, oh, a Christian can't have a demonic curse. Oh, oh, oh. Can they not? <laughs> and anyway, and they prayed for her. And, and suddenly there was this manifestation of something, <clears throat> coughed up something bloody. And, and long story short, and I say there were other parts to this. She was miraculously healed. The scan shows that, that she was miraculously healed and that's been verified and that was 16 years ago. They're living on the Isle of Man today and I mean, that's not my wineskin but if, if they hadn't have had as a couple a new wineskin, you know, what, what God maybe are you saying there rather than it has to be X, Y or Z. This is how you do it. <laughs> you know, God's always doing new things. Never in contradiction to the word but he's always doing New things, new things. God will do what God will do. He's always outside of the box. He's always, that's why we need to have a new wineskin. I mean, we all have our nice little safe traditions, but we need to be open to the spirit of truth, not the traditions of men. I remember a lovely family when I first came to Port St. Mary and they ended up leaving the church and they were so gener generous and giving and the first to help anyone. But you know what I discovered when they had problems? I could never help them. Well, I tried to help them. People, but they would never receive. And, and there's always this little phrase that came out. My mum always said. And that was what framed her spirituality. Not the word says. But my mum always said. And I really put a lid on the work of the Holy Spirit because her mum was a godly woman, but her mum was in the fountain of knowledge. And and it's a challenge for all of us that well, what's stopping you or me embracing the new line? What traditions? You know, is it a family background? Well, we were brought up to think this way. 
I've seen a lot of people that with baptism, you know, that they have not got baptized. Hey, I'd love to baptize you. And in groups of 30, if on the 15th of June, and they had a man, I'd love to baptize you and you, and you can go into the water your, yourself. We, I don't need to lay hands on you or a family member can. I'd love to baptize you from the 15th of June. But uh, you know, sometimes speak to people about, well, our family did it this way. Well, hey, with the greatest respect, not interested in what your family did. What's the word say? Repent and be baptized. And they went into the water. They came out of the water. It's, it's for believers. And it's done with a lot of water. Dying and raising. Or maybe it's your previous church. Our, our old church did it this way. Or well, my experience is this. Well, what about the Holy Spirit? What about the Holy Spirit? You know, the Bible says, for all who are led by the Spirit are sons of God. All who are led by the Spirit are sons of God. Who's leading you at the moment? Is it a who leading you or is it traditions leading you? Is it a habit leading you? Or is it he who's leading you? Is a person leading you? The third person of the Godhead? Now, we, I love Jesus and I love the Father, but do you have a relationship with the Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit? Hmm. Okay, let me just help us to keep the wine fizzing. Just one last thought. How do you keep this wine fizzing? Life. And so it doesn't spoil. Keep a smile on the Spirit's face. You see, the Spirit is not merely a presence. Some people confuse, like say, yes, the Holy Spirit is a representation of the presence of God on earth. Yes, He is the present, but He is the person of the Holy Spirit. One God, three persons. I remember R.T. Kendall saying about friends of his were missionaries in Jerusalem. Oh, I'd love to go to Jerusalem. Oh. I love the Holy Land. And uh, when they moved into their home, after a few weeks, you know, you start second guessing yourself, have we called this right? Is this the right place for us? And, and anyway, a pair of doves came and settled in their home on the roof. And wow, they said, you know, sign from the Lord, dove, Holy Spirit, resting, like the baptism of Jesus. The Spirit comes on and out like a dove. And oh, they were just filled with such, Lord's pleased with us, the Lord's smiling over us. And then, like all families and couples, you know, arguments, banging doors. And they notice that every time the door banged, they raised their voices. The doves would lift. The doves would fly away. They would lift their presence. And you know what Paul says? It's the same with the Holy Spirit. He says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Acts 4 and verse 30. How can he be grieved? Hi, well... You know, I have a, as a pastor grieved the Holy Spirit on many occasions. I remember the former bishop of the Isle of Man, lovely man, godly man, Bishop Robert. And I had a really, I mean, I had a helpful attitude at times towards other churches. And and uh, I wasn't making every effort to keep the, to, uh, keep the unity of the Spirit. And I remember just in this meeting, just with other church leaders, bang, <laughs> conviction. And Robert wasn't even there. And I just said, I need to, I just said to the archdeacon, I need to, I need to speak to Robert because I need to apologize. I haven't made every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. And I went to Robert's office and he was so generous. I apologized and anyway, he shared things as well. And, and I really, even that moment, I started to feel the smile of God on my life. Hmm. Holy Spirit loves it when we dwell together in unity. And I've known, you know, that the presence of God left when there's been pride, pride in my own life about me, pride about the church, uh, anger when I've been angry with my family, when I've been angry with other leaders, with saints. I felt his favor move. And I'm learning, yeah, you know, I'm 52 now, and I'm taking a long time, but I want to keep a smile on the face of God. I want to sin less. And Paul says, we make it our aim to please him. How can we bring him pleasure? How can we put a smile on his face? Well, I've, I've touched on things already, but welcome him. You know, you and I went to a real, this kind of all singing or dancing church in England once, and uh, we were invited into their green room. It was like oh, three or four rooms, all fancy all together. And, and then in the, center, in the corner of this table and, like the holy of holies and uh, but actually 
we we kind of were kept to stay three rooms away. You know, it was open plan, but we were like there, and and and, uh, and the senior pastor was over there, and and I mean, we were kind of struggling with that. I mean, let's be honest, not even church members and interns weren't even allowed in that green in that green room. But we were kept at a distance, and it just didn't feel right, you know. And and we 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 kind of said we didn't want to criticize anybody, but we but we from that moment on said we don't want to build a church like that. Hey, Paul says, see how we've been lived among you. Well, anyway, get back to the main thing. Are you welcoming the Holy Spirit or do you treat him like the weird family member? Are you, are you embarrassed to say, I love the Holy Ghost? Welcome him. You know, a friend of mine, Paul, some of you know Paul, and, and I'm eccentric and Paul's eccentric. We're all eccentric. But and Paul would tell me that occasionally uh, he used to kind of book dinners in fancy restaurants. Paul likes his food, and as I, well, I do as well, chicken wings. And uh, But he liked his food. And he would go to a fancy restaurant and book a table for two, but it would just be Paul sitting there, and i say, who's the other person? Oh, the Holy Spirit. We're just going to spend an evening together. I'm going to have him a meal and his drink and his fancy meal, and we just talk together. Just ask the Holy Spirit questions. Use that context. Now, you may say, Jonathan, that's extreme. I don't think it is extreme. I, I think that we, sadly, grieve him by just treating him as a presence rather than a person. You know, somebody once said to me, you know, read the book of Haggai. And I said, why, why? Because when you get to heaven and you meet him, he's going to ask you, have you read his book? <laughs> but you know what? If, if I really want to meet the Holy Spirit, I'm going to read the words of the Spirit, the words of life, the Scripture. Because when I get to heaven, you know, Father, Son, and Spirit. Have you read my book? Have you read the words? You know, all, all scripture is God breathed. These are the words of the Spirit of God. Hmm. Do you know what the Holy Spirit loves it when in faith we take new territory? He says, yes, I've been waiting for you to join me in this. By faith when we step out. Yeah, faith, you see, pleases God. Yes, Jonathan, yes. You stepped out, you got baptized, you shared your three-minute testimony. Yes. Wow, I'm so happy. I've been waiting for you. When we give generously, you know, yes, well done. When we tithe, even that, when we tithe, you know, yes, well done. You haven't got a poverty spirit. You're not living in fear. You know, you're, you're oh, well, well done. The smile of God. Yeah. You know, one of the testimonies I looked at last week on Facebook, one of the young ladies in the church, and she shared she'd been brought up in church all her life, but in church, she always felt condemned and uh, uh, fear and guilt and left church uh, in, in her teens and has only recently just come to know the Lord as the one who smiles over her. And you know, that's, I mean, the truth is, I, I'm sure I've done that in the Living Hope family. I've preached or led services in such a way that didn't, didn't help. <laughs> you know, Paul says your services do more harm than good. I'm sure I've done that, but hopefully we're getting it right. <laughs> and uh you know, now she senses the smile of God over her. And But how do we sense the smile of God? Well, we make it our aim to please him. And as I've been telling the church from Romans, he is for you. He is for you. And as we conclude now, you know, receive this word. Look at the prophet Zephaniah says, and this is old covenant. How much more in the new? For the Lord your God is living among you. That's even old. New, he's living in you, with you. He is a mighty savior. He will take delight in you with gladness. With his love, he will calm all your fears. He will rejoice over you with joyful songs. As you live in a way that reflects Jesus and you desire to please him, listen for his voice. Listen for the song of heaven over you. Hey, even as you mess up and then you receive the grace and you say sorry, he loves repentance. Repentance is a gift which opens up rivers of, you know, you messed up. Okay, so we'll have me all. And now as you repent, it opens up rivers of refreshing and you hear him singing over you. Wow. Mm. Let's not be another generation of the church that feels the touch for a little while and because we are wineskins that don't stretch or won't stretch and make room for the old, that we can't expand and everything spoils and spills. 
Hey church, it's time to welcome the Holy Spirit, to welcome the new wine. Be eager. I'm going to pray for you in a moment. Follow the truth. Nothing the Holy Spirit does will ever contradict the truth, but make sure you're not following traditions and the truth is a person. And keep a smile on his face. Can you hear the Father singing over you today? Let's ask for new wine. Even Jesus said, look, like I know you have people, you've got fears and anxieties and inadequacies, but if you ask the Father, he'll give you the Holy Spirit. That's Luke 11 and verse 13. We're going to receive new wine today. You know, this isn't about alcohol. <laughs> Don't get drunk on wine. This is about the Holy Ghost. And we just need to ask. Jesus has come to give us life in all of its fullness. And how do you start this new life? Maybe you're saying, John, I want that life. I want that bubbling holiness, joy-filled, and yeah, I want that life. Well, you turn from your sin, your whole life, because you can't have both. You put your faith in what Jesus has done on the cross, and then you receive his forgiveness. Then you receive the Holy Spirit, and you receive eternal life. You know, if you're if you're saying, count me in, I'm going to start today, I'll do, I'll pray that for you right now, and why don't you just, even on the live stream, say, I want to start our pack, I do that, do that right now, and I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to pray for the church, you know. And so just position yourself, open your hands to receive all that God wants to do in you. Father, I want to pray for those today who are starting the journey, who want this new life. Jesus, you say you come to give life in all its fullness. Come, meet with them, I pray. In Jesus' name, fill them afresh, I pray. So as those who are starting the new life, turn from their sin. Tell Jesus you're turning from your sin. Tell him you're putting your faith in what he's done on the cross. Yeah. That he alone died for your sins. That he alone can make peace with God. Now I receive his forgiveness. I speak his forgiveness over you. Receive the Holy Spirit in your home. And receive the free gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let me just pray for the church. Yeah, church. Yeah, open your hands, arms. Maybe lay hands on one another where you are. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. We want to be new wineskins. We don't want to be old bags. We want to be new wineskins. We want to be able to stretch. Let the fizz, the new wine of the Spirit flow in and through us. Yeah, Lord, may we change our paradigms. We don't want this wine and us to spoil. We're, until we see you face to face, until uh, we, we see you in your second coming or the grave, whatever comes first, we want to go from glory to glory. Come, Holy Spirit, today. May the new line of wine of God be evident in our lives. Overwhelm us. Overflow in us. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Restore us the joy of our salvation. For those who've been barren and dry in a, in a wilderness, I speak a river in the desert. Even though it may be a little trickle today, it starts today. And a river of God is coming, a mighty tsunami over your life over your life in Jesus name welcome in Jesus name in Jesus name Holy Spirit come Holy Spirit come in Jesus name yeah and let's declare in some Holy Spirit you are welcome here